Shalom. My goodness, was that not good? How many of y'all already blessed this morning? Amen. My goodness. Hey, that's what it's about, right? I am so excited. So we're in the middle. I don't want to say what we're in the middle. We're way in the middle of a message series. If you haven't been with us um, over the last few weeks, um, we're in, I don't know what, we're on week five, week six. Um, we're on track. Yes, let's dismiss our kids' nation. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> when the teachers are glaring at you, you know what you have missed. Praise the Lord. Man, look at all these beautiful kids. Praise God. Good to see all these beautiful, 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 especially that last one right there. Well, the second, yeah, they're, they're all beautiful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, if you haven't been catching us, uh, I want to encourage you, go online to um, our, our YouTube page. You can go to our website. I usually post the, on our website. I usually go on our website, and you can actually um, click recent messages, and it's usually there from last week. But if you want to catch up and you've not been staying in touch with us um, through the series, then I want to challenge you to go to our YouTube page, Epic Life Terrell. Just look up Epic Life Terrell on YouTube, and um, you'll find it. This has been a, this is a foundational uh, message series that we're doing and we have taken the letter of Paul to the Galatians, and we're really dissecting it and looking at the truth and looking at what's been so misunderstood and taught um, in for hundreds of years. And so we're going to continue uh, with that today. Praise God. We should be wrapping up uh, chapter 2 of Galatians. And believe it or not, we may even get into Galatians chapter 3. Uh, we're only in week 6, and we're in chapter too, <laughs> praise God. But it's been, uh, it's been a very eye-opening message series. And that's the design, is to help us to understand what was Paul uh, really saying. So last week, Paul kind of, uh, the Apostle Paul brings the Torah into the mix. He brings in um, what the Torah is about and uh, teaching that circumcision was not mandated for the Gentiles. And he brings this in and he like hits this right between the eyes, powerful uh, powerful, and really, he was forced to do it. He was forced into understanding this because of what has been uh, being brought into the church. And as a reminder, uh, it's uh, Paul says uh, when he brought up the Torah, you, you cannot be saved by obedience. He brings in this verse sixteen of, of Galatians, which many of us know, right? That you cannot be saved uh, through through obedience to the Torah. But we have to understand what Paul really was saying. Because if you take it at first glance, as we have taught over the last few weeks, yes, you would say, hey, see, we don't have to do a Torah. Today, I really want to unpack that um, and do it. So, but, but why does he bring that up? Because uh, someone cannot be justified by the obedience of the law. And we have to ask the question, why? Why is it impossible for someone to be justified? That word justified simply means to be made right. How are we not made right for the obedience of the Torah? Simple. No one could obey it fully. No one could complete the Torah. We all fail to keep God's law. But does Paul leave us here? Does he leave us hanging on this idea that nobody can fulfill Torah, that we've all broken Torah, and therefore no one can be made right? No. He brings in Yeshua, right? And we're going to enter, uh, enter that. He sends us these amazing anchor statements that we talked over the last two weeks. What was supposed to be just a one-week message actually turned into a two-week message when we dealt with week four uh, of this. And so he sends these anchor statements, the statements that say that you are not saved by obedience to the law or by the Torah, but that we are, not, uh, but we are also not to take the Torah or the law and completely discard it. We're not to get rid of it. That's the mistake that I think many of us uh, have made in, in the past. And as a pastor, I've even preached that, that that's what we're supposed to do. We're not to throw out the law. We don't walk away from it or turn our back on it. God forbid what we do as believers now in Messiah, we establish it. Amen. We establish it in the life that we are called to live, a life of holiness, a life of Kodesh. And we stand on the Torah of the Lord in our faith. So now we're going to continue in this dialogue as we unpack and go into Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. I'm probably going to hang out here for a minute. So in Galatians 2, 19, it reads, are we already up there? It's, okay, it's not on the board. Well, we'll just read from here. Praise the Lord. 
So it says, for through the law or law, I died to law. I want you to remember that statement. So that I might live for God, I have been crucified with Messiah. So we look at this, 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 this phrase that I want to talk about for a minute, this 219, powerful. And he says in this 19, he says, for through the law, I died. So in Greek, if you don't know, I love words. And so this morning as I was going through this message, I looked at something. I was like, man, that is super powerful. And I want to talk about this. So in Greek, it's dia nomos nomos apotheniskio. Apotheniskio. This is powerful. Now, I want you to get this for a moment. This phrase that we we see here, I'm going back and forth here a little bit. Um, For through the law I died to law. That phrase, law I died to law, is powerful. It's the phrase that we get in the Greek, dia nomos nomos. The word nomos means law. Now, I want you to hear, you don't have to know Greek. I want you to listen to what's being said in the Greek. Listen to what it says. Dia, that's through or through. Nomos, nomos. You see something? That the word in Greek, it's mentioned back to back. Law and law. They're mentioned back to back. It's not as we've got a phrase that we've interpreted in the English where it says, for through law, I died to law. Right? Now, the word... Uh, uh, apothenesco, that's the word to die. To drown is actually the original translation in the Greek. It means that he drowned the law. But listen to what it says when you interpret Scripture. It's so vital that we get this right. And this is where we've messed it. This is where, watch this. So I want to take, I want, let me go to one other word. No, I'll read this first and I'm going to bring another word into the, in, into the dichotomy of what we're talking about. So de nomos nomos apothenesco. I died through the law, the law is dead, or I died. Powerful. Now, a good general rule of interpretation is that if a word appears more than once in a passage, especially if they're next to each other, so nomos, nomos, powerful, I'm going to do this. Look, I am not the sharpest tool in shed, okay, some of you teachers, I am a D student graduate, praise the Lord, okay? So it took me a minute, so I'm going to walk this through. And if you are more smarter than me, is that a, can I use that phrase, more smarter? No, I just totally, I just leave out more. Leave out more. If, I'm, if I'm not smarter than you, okay, you're smarter than I am, um, then maybe you'll get it. I had to go real slow, okay, praise the Lord. I was, I was that student. But I want you to get this. A good general rule of interpretation is that a word appears more than once in a passage. Its meaning stays the same throughout the passage. Now, here we have an exception, though. Oh, get this. The phrase means, in the Greek, for I, through Torah, to legalism, died. When he puts the two words together, nomos, nomos, he's using it like the opposites. In other words, hot and cold, good and evil. Does it make sense? So in the Greek, when he writes this down and he gives us this, what he's telling us is that there's a good part of Torah. Torah is good. We already know that from last couple of weeks, right? The Torah is spiritual. The Torah is good. There's nothing wrong with the Torah. It's this other part that he's talking about. And he says the legalistic part, the legalism. Now, we have to understand legalism. We're going to go into that in a minute. Now, I know that because Paul avoids the natural Greek word order in order to place two forms of the word nomos side by side. He completely bypasses it. This signals the reader that something unusual is going on, specifically that the sense of the first nomos, the first word law or Torah, differs from that of the second. It's not the same. My expanded translation brings out the first nomos is the true Torah. So when we see that first word law, that first Torah mentioned in Scripture, right? From the law, I've been freed from the death of the law, right? So that first one differs from that of the second. And it's the nomos is that the first part of that word, nomos, is true. It's good. You understand? Hot and cold. Good. The first nomos we see Paul writes is good. Understanding properly is requiring trusting faithfulness, while the second is a perversion of the first, or that Torah, in other words, legalistic. Now, before we move on, let me, let me break it down in a better sense to you. 
when Yeshua was on the earth, the Pharisees had a problem with Yeshua. And when you get this, this passage will make complete sense to you. And I didn't put the scripture down, but I'm going to reference the scripture for us to understand. So when Yeshua began to preach the Torah and preach the law in which he did, Paul and Yeshua had something in common, and that is they both taught us to obey the commands and taught us to obey God. There's no, there's no, there's no, you can't fight against that. But what happened was Yeshua taught against the Pharisaic law. You've got to get this. The Pharisaic law was the, what would they call the, the Talmud or the oral law. And it went against the traditions of the Pharisees. Hence, we see a conversation after Yeshua rebukes them. They all gather together and say, what are we going to do with this guy? Because if we continue to allow him to teach, he'll ruin our customs and our traditions. So the argument is not against Torah. It's against an oral law. This is what Paul is referencing back to when he says, when he says the Greek, dia nomos, nomos apatheneko, meaning the Torah. The Torah is good, the good Torah, but now it's destroyed the legalistic Torah. It goes completely against the Pharisaic law. Does that, are, are you all on the same page? Are we all, I mean, I know that's kind of like some heavy, heavy, deep, deep stuff. The idea here is to understand that the Torah has not been done away with and that the argument that's happening in the book of Galatians in which we have talked about for the past six weeks is about circumcision and the legal, holding up legalism for salvation. Now, we have to understand what does legalism mean. Legalism by its definition means to carry out an order or Follow the law in order to gain salvation, in order to be made right with God. In other words, if I don't cuss, if I don't swear, if I don't chew, and if I don't run with girls that do, then I'm going to heaven. Amen. Okay? That's not what it means. It means that my circumcision, though I get it in the flesh, does not give me the right to earn heaven and salvation. And it doesn't say that once you start, see, it's all about the, we're going to go into this, but it's about the, the spirit. We're being circumcised by the spirit in our hearts. We've been circumcised. Now, moving on from that understanding, we're going to do this again in Galatians 2.19 again. But here's what we talked about last week if we wrapped it up, is that the, the author, we're going to go back into the book of Romans. Why Romans, right? We established the last couple of weeks that if you want to have a comparison book, but one that goes into greater detail, go to the book of Romans. Go to the book. Now, why the book of Romans? And why is the Romans a little bit deeper in comprehension that Paul wrote to the church in Rome? Why is that deeper than the one in Galatia? Well, number one, Paul didn't go to Rome until the end of his ministry. So he had more time. He had more, uh, uh, more ability to uh, write this to them and give them a clearer understanding, especially in spite of what was already happening in some of the other churches around Galatia or Asia Minor. Now, so let's look at the book of Acts, or I'm sorry, Romans, but let's compare it to Galatians chapter 219. I want to show you something as we move through this. I think I was able to put both of those passages up. Very good. So it says Galatians 2.19. For the, I'm going to go ahead and walk over here, guy. Uh, we're going to look. because I don't have it up there. And I like to point. I wish I had a stick. Okay. Maybe not. It says, for, for though through the law, I died to law. That's that no mostly no most. There we go. Okay. So that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Messiah. Romans 7.4 says the exact same thing, but goes into deeper comprehension. Watch, right? It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were made what? Dead to the Torah through the body of Messiah. Deeper comprehension. Better understanding of what Paul is saying. Remember, this is the same author. That's what I love about Paul is that the more you study Paul, the more you see his books and his writings, the more you're going to see comparative language. You'll see languages that are similar. It's just like uh, people who hang around me. We have certain phrases that we constantly use all the time, right? And, and you, do, you do as well. You write an email, and I know who it is based a lot of times by the way we, we wrote it. So Paul here, he, he puts the case in the first person singular, no longer living under the power of the law. He has been released from its dominion and has entered into a new life, the life through, obviously, bearing fruit in Messiah. 
Now, reading these two passages together, you may think that it sounds, again, what we've been talking about over the last several weeks, that Paul is saying that the law has been done away with. But that's not when you start looking at the scriptures in comparative, you see something that's very, very powerful. And unfortunately, this is the mistake that so many people make. However, I want us to see that Paul uses two words, and actually even our translation of the Bible are a little bit interchangeably, and that is the word Torah. Your translation may say what? Law, that's right. So Torah and law, but there's another word that Paul uses interchangeably when he uses the word Torah or law. He uses another word. Anybody want to guess what that is? Okay, good. Praise the Lord. That means you're going to pay attention. All right? Paul uses two words here interchangeably, and by doing so, it can change the context of what is really being said. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans 6, 11. Look at this. Uh, go back to, is it going to be both of them? It is both of them together, but you may not be able to get it on there. Right? Okay. Can we shrink that real quick so they, they can see it, make it fit the screen a little bit better? All right, I want to read it while they're listening and watching. I'm going to read it. Romans chapter 6, verse 7 says, So also continually count yourselves both dead to sin and alive to God in Messiah Yeshua. And then verse 7, 4, Romans, of what you already looked at. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were made dead to the Torah or the law. That's right. So he interchanges. I do have it underlined, which you can see that. He interchanges dead to sin and dead to the Torah. The question we have to ask ourselves when you're looking at Scripture, I know this is way orthodox. I know going back and forth to the screen. If I had a great big TV screen, we may be able to point to it, right? The question is, is he talking about the same thing? That's exactly right. He's talking the same thing, but what he's doing is he's interchanging those words. And the more you read Paul, the more you'll even see where they say things like the law of Moses. He'll even use that in the terminology. There's so many places within the context of Scripture where Paul does this. And if you're not paying attention, it can change the context in your, in your head or in your spirit or when they translate it. But Paul's not doing that. Paul is saying the exact same thing. He does this multiple times throughout the book of Romans. And I want us to pay attention to this. How, how is Paul able to do this? Well, unless this is the same thing. Now, I want you to see what Paul is doing. Remember the anchor statement. See, when he mentions every one of these, what does he follow up with? An anchor statement. Every single time he brings in those anchor statements. Now, I think in your worship guide, one of your homework assignments that I want you to do as you study is to go back, either watching the messages or on your own, and find those anchor statements. Write down the anchor statements that are speaking to you. I think that would be very good for all of us to do that. So what you're going to see is Paul is and knows that there could be confusion in the statement, in looking at that passage of sin and Torah or law. And so what does he do? He puts anchor statements in, such as this one found in Romans chapter 7, just a couple of verses later in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the Torah sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have known sin. See here what he did? Did you see it? Except through the Torah. For I would not have known about coveting if the Torah had not said, you shall not covet. Understand that Paul is not saying that they are the same. For as we have already studied, the Torah law is holy and good. Not one is bad and one is good. He's saying that, that if I had not known that, then it would be the other, right? Because sin is vile and ugly, but Torah is what? What did we learn last week? That is good. It's holy. It's spiritual. Right? Those were the comments that Paul himself made throughout the book of Romans. He never said that the, uh, that the Torah was bad or it was ugly or whatever. No, what he did was he said sin was. And it was sin that causes death. Amen? Now watch. This is good. So what are we supposed to take away from this? Understanding the interchangeably of these words, Paul unlocks something that's very, very, a very special key. And it's a very special door. Now, remember I told you that when you start looking at the writings of Paul, what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing similarities in his wording. And he does the same thing in another passage. All right? It's a very small statement that you may miss that I've missed. They're actually I'm going to show you two today, this morning. This one is the first one. I'm going to show you one at the end of our service. Another one that we have missed as the body of Christ. Now, 
It's a very small, very small statement, but the power behind it and the clarity, clarity that it brings, and it's found in the book of Corinthians. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. I want you to look at this. Now the sting of death is what? Let's say it together. For the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is what? Torah. Do you see a separation happening? Absolutely. There is so much. Um, you've got to, there is so much in this passage. It, it hits a, with, a, with, a, with a punch. Now, I want to give you an example of what this means. This is, oh my goodness. I've shared this before, but it's been a while since I've shared this statement. We're in Texas. And um, in Texas, we have things called water moccasins. There are, they are ugly ugly snakes and we have other things called rattle i think we have like 50 brands of rattlers i don't know i just know they're everywhere and then you also have the copperhead right now probably the most out of those three which would you say is the most poisonous rattler moccasin i would say the moccasin as well so let's say you get bit by a moccasin and you're out there on lake tawakany or lake levon and you're out there in the middle of nowhere you can't get anywhere what's going to happen to you good chance you're going to die if you get bit Strong enough. Now, what does this have to do with our, with our conversation? Because the bite from that snake, listen to me, get this, is sin. The bite of this is the, the latching on, but the venom is the Torah or the law. So the bite is the actual sin, but the venom of that bite is the law. It's the venom is what kills. Sin has no power apart from the law. I mean, let me, let me give proof to that. So if there was no Torah, if there was no law, would sin exist? Absolutely not. What did Paul say? Had the law not told me not to covet, I would not know what coveting was. Y'all follow me? So the sin... Sin is just sin. And here's, how, here's the thing. How did we get sin? How did sin get into our life? Adam and Eve. That's right. I heard somebody say it out there. Because of the fall of man. And so because of that, they invited sin into us. Now, we talked about this last week of this, uh, this argument that's going on inside of Paul in the book of Romans where he says, you know, who will deliver me from this body of shame and sin? Praise be to Jesus, the Messiah. Because Why? This is good. The law is the power, and it has the power to condemn. Sin has no power apart from the law. Now watch. Understand this. Who Yeshua is. you got to get this. This will deliver somebody this morning. He's the anti-venom. He's the anti-venom. He's the one, because of what He did on the cross of Calvary, He delivers us from that venom but it doesn't mean that we get to go play with snakes. It doesn't mean we can continue to go and just do whatever we want. We come to the cross, we get our anti-venom, and then we go right back into playing with the stuff again. We don't get to do that. That's where I think the mistake is within the body of Messiah. Romans 8.1, it says, Therefore, watch, there is no condemnation for those in Messiah Yeshua. There is no condemnation. Why? Because he's removed the venom. There's no more venom. What does that mean? It means that now we get to live the life that we were created for, obedience to God's command. And if we fail those commands, we have an anti-venom. If we break the law and we get stuck again, right, we have the anti-venom in Messiah. Yeshua has rescued us from the venom not so that we can go, anti, go get the anti-serum and go play with the snakes again. No, so that we can be free from the death that the venom brings. So does that mean we can run off and do whatever we want, i.e. play with snakes? I hope not. We're not that type of church. Praise God. Okay, I'm just letting you know. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set us free from the law of sin and death. Now, I want you to get that phrase. Watch this. What are we free from? Are we free from the Torah? No, from the law of what? Sin and death. That's the law that's at place. That's the law that, 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 that we're having this controversy with. The law of sin and death. 
were rescued. Why? That gives me now freedom to approach the throne of grace that I might receive mercy in a time of need. In other words, no matter how guilty I am of breaking the Torah, I now have access point back to the Father. I've been redeemed. I've been justified. Not because of my works, but by the works of the cross of Messiah. Isn't that beautiful? Once we have an understanding of Torah and grace, it makes so much more sense. You and I have been free from the curse of the law, which is death. Somebody had to die. Because we can't keep the Torah. The, the, the death of Messiah does not eliminate the Torah. But it eliminates the consequences of breaking the Torah through Messiah. Romans 8, 3 through 4. For what was impossible for the Torah, since it was weakened on account of the flesh, right? God has done sending His own Son in the likeness of the sinful flesh. He was perfect. He followed the Torah completely, never missed a beat. And as a sin offering, condemned sin in the flesh. He became the sacrifice. We must see this, that Paul is telling us that everyone who dies with Christ, watch this, is fulfilling the requirement of the law when you die in Christ. Now watch. Why do you think we get immersed Watch this. Why do we get immersed? Because you are representing the death. You're coming into agreement with Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection. When you get immersed, that's why it's commanded that as believers in Messiah, when you get saved, the next step you need to do is get immersed, baptized. Why? Because you're following and you're, you're agreeing with the sacrifice. And you're coming in symbolically and spiritually, you're being killed. Right? But you're not physically having to die anymore. Why? Messiah did it for you. Come on, church. That's freedom, man. That's freedom from all of this garbage that we've been listening to. Death. I've said this before, before breaking of the law and always will result. The breaking of the law always requires death. Of the Ten Commandments, nine of them have a death sentence. The one does have a death sentence, the one that's not, but it's kind of further out. It's further in. You have to do more studying into it. But immediately, you can go to uh, Deuteronomy, I believe it's Deuteronomy 11 or 12, and it shows 11 curses that are attached to what? To the breaking of the Torah. And every one of them result in death. Messiah paid that penalty. That's why we get immersed. Matter of fact, Romans 6, I believe that's where I'm at, 6, 4, and 5, is that where I'm at? Therefore, we were buried together with Him. Who? Who? Messiah, that's right, Jesus, through immersion into death in order that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too might we walk in the newness of life. We are coming into agreement with Messiah. And that what Messiah did, his sacrifice, his penalty, he paid the penalty for our sin and we've now become justified. Why are you immersed, baptized? I already said this, you're following Christ in death because the law required that there be death. And only death is not a physical one any longer, but now it's a spiritual one. See, when you get to know Paul and you begin to see these comments and these statements, like I'm freed from the law, dead to sin, and I died to Moshiach, and I'm died in Moshiach. Here, here's what I want you to get. Watch this statement. I want you to write this statement down. I think it's in your worship guide. Circle it, highlight it. What can the law say against Messiah? He was perfect. He never broke the law. He never did it. Nothing. He was perfect. And because of him, we can walk in the law or Torah, not what? Fearing the consequences of breaking the Torah. See, if I mess up, and I know you guys, I know everyone here is perfect but me, okay? I know that. I get it, all right? But when, I'm, when I do something outside of love or I do something outside of my love for God or love for others, watch this, right? I don't have to have a sacrifice anymore. And the condemnation that once held me down and created death in me, I'm now created in life because Messiah paid the price. Does that make sense? This is good one-on-one, one -on -one, the, the, theology one-on-one. -on -one. Where am I at? Praise the Lord. There we go. Yeshua made a large deposit when he died upon the cross for our righteousness. It follows the pattern of what Moses tried to do to the nation after the incident of the golden calf. But still, it wasn't enough because there had to be 
a sacrifice. There had to be a death. Messiah became that death for us so that we can live freely, obedient to the Father. It's the demonstration of God's love by saying, you know what? You can't pay the high cost that's going to cost for you to mess up, but we'll do it. And we do it through Messiah. Galatians 2, 20 through 21, continuing on. And it is no longer I who live, many of you know this passage, but Messiah lives in me, and the life I now live in the body, I live by trusting in Belohim, or the, uh, the Father who loved me and gave himself up for me. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through Torah, then Ma- Messiah died for no reason. Again, easy to misunderstand this passage without understanding the whole thing. Notice here that Paul is a keeper of the Torah. And what he says is, I no longer live, but Messiah is the one living in him. We have to remember the backdrop here. He's telling Gentiles that he himself does not set aside the grace of God because he's a Torah observant. No, even he recognizes the need for grace for salvation. Remember the word grace is God's unmerited favor. Unmerited, unearned. You cannot earn it from obedience to the Torah. The fact that Paul has to tell them that tells us something, doesn't it? The fact that Paul has to tell them, right, that you don't set aside the grace of God, why is he saying that to the Gentiles? If he's telling them that, it's a very good chance that they did that, that they set it aside. I want us to be clear here again, and I know this sounds very repetitious for us as a church, but we need to understand that we are saved by grace, God's unmerited favor. We could not do this on our own. We, weren't, we couldn't pay the price that was due. This is the issue Paul is addressing. See, it's not about whether to be circumcised or not. It's, not, it's about the gospel. And it's about them abandoning what they had learned, coming into faith in Messiah and becoming included in the family. Because the Pharisees had come in and said, if you really want to be all-inclusive, if you really want all the benefits, then what you have to do is be circumcised. And Paul is coming at them, man. He's throwing everything, including the Torah, back at them, saying, no, that's not how it's done. You're not saved through obedience to the Torah. But he doesn't dismiss the Torah either. They were willing to allow a different gospel to come in. Remember the reminder of what he said to them in the first chapter of Galatians. Do you remember? He said, even if, Galatians 1.8, even if, We or an angel from heaven should announce any other good news, any other gospel to you other than what we have proclaimed to you, let that person be accursed. The gospel message was that we were sinners and we needed needed salvation. They came in and said, well, you got to be circumcised to be all in. Now, because of this, let's continue into chapter 3. Watch this. This is, going to get, this is going to get good. Okay, Galatians 3, 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who cast a spell on you before your eyes, Yeshua the Messiah was clearly portrayed as crucified. Yeshua always taught the people to walk with Jehovah according to the written commandments of Moses. Paul follows up the same teaching, the same guidance, where he pointedly opens to Galatians 3, 1 with some very powerful language. And he says to them, you foolish Galatians. So we have to understand something, that these people were coming in, they were giving their life to the Lord, and they weren't starting the first church of Jerusalem. They were going to synagogue, and they were uh, were blending in. But the Pharisees came in and did what they did. They perverted this message. And these guys have been taught. Why? Because there's so many things that were going on, right? I mean, James sends a letter to them saying, hey, Don't believe these guys. We see all this stuff happening. Now watch, this word foolish, that phrase, you foolish Galatians, in Arabic means sakal, it means foolishness, stupidity, not using good sense. Paul was saying, you stupid Galatians, in just literal terms. And he says, why do you lack using good sense? Now I know we've never said that to our children, right? Right? But I wonder sometimes if the father is saying, hey, come on, guys, wake up. I'm trying to show you the way to life. The other phrase it means, it means think or consider something. In the Greek, anateos, it means it has the same meaning. 
It means foolishness. Now, some manuscripts even add this, uh, this phrase, your manuscript may add it, that you should not obey the truth. In other words, someone, you foolish Galatians, who has come in and, and taught you another truth, right? But he's referencing the entire text that he'll talk about in Galatians 5. But he's texting, he's referring to the truth that was brought to them through James, through the apostles, through Paul, through Peter. He's referencing back, who's fooled you knowing what now we know about the truth of, 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 of the gospel? And indeed, by them submitting to a local Pharisaic authority and their laws, these Galatians were sure to come up short in regards to righteousness. Remember the word righteousness is what? Does anybody remember what that word means? To be in right standing, that's right. To be in right standing with God. So they're trying to create another form of being in right standing with the Father by simply obeying the customs and the traditions of the Pharisees. They said, that's not how it's done. It's the same argument that we've been talking about. These Galatians were sure to come up short in regards to righteousness. Why? Because Pharisaic law circumcision is not, cannot produce life. We already established that it produces nothing but death. It cannot bring new life. It only brings death. Living by a Pharisaic reg regulation can be a, a, like a quick feel-good sugar high. It feels good to do it because that's, we see that within the church. We see this in the church today. I'm going to give you an example. We have, two spec we have one spectrum, but we have either we're on one end of the spectrum or we're on the other end of the spectrum. The one end of the spectrum is the Pharisaic law. Is that we, you know, I'm right, I'm right, look how righteous I am, look how clean I am because I obey this over here, right? Negating grace. But then over here, you have the very opposite, don't you? Where we are all about grace, 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 grace. I can come to Jesus, I get saved, but I never, my life never changes, right? I want to say that I love God, but the Bible says in John 14, 15, right? It says that if you love me, obey my commandments, but we don't obey God's commandments, right? So we have this, this law that's teeter-tottering between grace and legalism on this other end, and God says, no, 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 you missed it. It's right here. See, we obey the commands of God, but we do it because of grace, We've been brought in by grace, not because of this down here. Does that make sense? We've got to get this understanding as we grow. This powerful, powerful message that we're learning by this. It goes back to the, 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 the dogma of the argument that's been happening within the church. You don't have to do this. You do have to do this. It feels good to do that for a while, but eventually it can leach the life out of your sh and should, leaving you dry and empty. Then you are continually forced to refill your soul with the daily supply of man-made commandments and long prayers. Jesus said it this way to the Pharisees. He said, you uphold the traditions of men above the commandments of God. See, this is the argument that the Pharisees hated because Yeshua came in and said, look, you're, what they had done is they created, they insulated their own rules, their own laws, their own way of being holy. And they negated God's commands. And so Yeshua shows up to do what? to show them the Father's command and to show them how to live a life of righteousness that pleases the Father, not based upon who? Men. And that's been the whole argument. Go, go do a study on that, on the Pharisaic laws, and see what Jesus came in, and they hated him for it so much that they killed him because they loved their traditions more than they loved God. And here's the thing, and a warning to us Gentiles, don't you love your traditions more than you have a love for the Father? Because we can create our own, can't we? We can create our own. I, I, we used to be a part of a church, and I know Texas, when you say, bless their heart, I know what that means. And I want to say, bless their heart. Because they were a church that was a very non-traditional, which is fine, um, but one of the things they were so proud of was that they weren't legalistic. But here's what happened. They became legalistic in not being legalistic. So much so that they watered this thing down so much that no one knew what the truth of the gospel was. It was great motivational speeches up on the pl platform. Songs were great, rocking songs, right? But they guarded their traditions. And we do the same thing. Don't us like snub our nose on these Pharisees, man, and think that they're, well, yeah, I'm glad I'm not one of them. Yeah, but what do you do hold? What is your golden calf? What's the golden calf that you hold on to? We got to be careful with that. Matthew 5, 19 and 20, Jesus warned, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments, watch what he said, powerful, and teaches others the same 
shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, watch, exceeds that of the Pharisees and Torah scholars. Remember what their righteousness was about. It was about their law, their rule. Their, their, they insulated the Torah. They thought they were doing good. But they worshiped those above. You shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are powerful words from our Messiah. And he says, man, your righteousness has to exceed them. How in the world can we do that? Well, the Pharisees' job was what? To guard and protect the Torah. But they didn't. They created their own legalism. They created their own system. And now that means that it's got to be more than that. You mean the Jesus... Uh, we, how many times have we heard random trout for... Uh, Place, just for a second, okay. How many times have we heard, you don't have to do nothing to get saved. Come on, somebody. You ain't got to do nothing to go to heaven. It's grace. It's free. You have to do nothing. Is that true? It's not true. Even the statement of itself means I still have to repent of my sin. So therefore, I have to do something. I have to be immersed. Therefore, I have to do something. I have to have evidence. I have to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, and all my strength. I have to love my neighbor as I love myself. These are all mitzvot of the Father. They're commandments. You do have to do something. And we've misguided the scriptures so much. I know I need to go on. I need to move on. Praise God. Where am I at? Okay. We must remember that Yeshua said that we had to do better than that of the Pharisees and the scholars. But us, by us keeping the written commandments of the Torah, not the oral law of the scholars and the Pharisees, it is you and, it's you and I's responsibility to study the scriptures. You know how you prevent yourself from being deceived, church? Learn this Bible. I've said this for now several years now. Don't just take what the guy up here says, and no matter how good looking he is. I was talking about Dustin. That's the only reason why he's on staff. I'm telling you right now. We had to bring some, some, some good looks into the, in, into the, you know, Stephen and I, we just, no, we're, we're, we're homey looking. It is, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Study the scriptures. Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved and a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing. Rightly divine things. Let's continue. Galatians 3, verse 2. I want to find out just one thing. This is powerful. Watch this. I want to find out just one thing from you. Did you receive... Oh, thank you, Father. Did you receive the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, by deeds based on the Torah or by hearing based on trust or faith? This is powerful. There is so much in this. Oh, this thing. Wallop, man. It's like a rock. I watched Rocky last night during uh, Sabbath. Yeah. So it's like this Rocky punch, you know, knocks the guy. The only guy in rocking, boxing history can take as many punches to the face as that dude. I praise God. But look, now I want to ask you a question. All right? So this is huge. So he's asking a question, but I want you to ask a question to answer the question. I know that sounds confusing. It's not. All right? Now, when you get, okay, let me say it this way. Let me just stick to my notes, okay? It works a lot easier. Be, so when did you receive the Holy Spirit? When do you receive the promise of, Listen to me real close. When do you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit? Before salvation or after salvation? All right, let's do it like this. How many believe after you're saved? How many believe before you're saved? How many don't know? All right, praise God. All right, we're honest. Praise God. That's good. All right. Understanding this passage, it's so big. bring that passage up and hold it for me. Thank you very much. I want to find out just one thing from you. Watch. Did you receive the Ruach before ba deeds based on Torah or by hearing based on the trust? Who are we talking to based on that scripture? People that are, pe Gentiles that are what? Saved. Now, what is the Ruach? What is the Holy Spirit from God? What does it represent? It's very powerful. What is it? It's the what? Seal of approval. It's the seal to say what? That you're saved, that you belong to the Father. So here's something, I'm going to break some bubbles real quick. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, guess what? I didn't write it, that's what the Bible says, okay? I'm just saying, all right? Paul is saying, how did you receive the Spirit? By deeds, circumcision of the flesh, 
or by faith. I love this because he, this is dealing with salvation. It's not dealing with the Torah. How were you saved? How did you get the seal of approval? By works? Or by faith? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Y'all are getting this, man. This is so, so good. Now watch what happens in Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish? Here we go again. He said it again. After beginning with the Spirit, in other words, God's seal of approval by faith, will you now reach the goal in the flesh? In other words, circumcision. Some translations even say by the deeds of the flesh. And that's huge. Why? Because he's refer referencing again physical circumcision. See, this is not anti-Torah. This is not anti-law. It actually, it's all about the Torah. It's all about salvation and grace and how we received it. Amen? Whew. Praise the Lord. I don't even know where I'm at on my notes here. Praise the Lord. I'm almost done, guys. You can wake up now. Where are we at? Ah, okay. See, here Paul says it again, foolish Galatians. In modern vernacular, have you lost your minds is what he's telling us. Are you, have you, have you, did, you, did you ever say to your children when they did something just so full, are you out of your ever-loving mind? I did that one time with my son. I won't say which son. I know y'all are looking at him, okay? <laughs> now, it may or may not have been the one that's in our community this morning. Y'all heard the story about him and his homework before? Have y'all heard that story? That's a wonder. I love that story. You mind if I share that again with him? Oh, oh please, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, out of your ever-loving mind, praise the Lord. Came home one day, and we knew that he wasn't getting his homework done because he was getting ISS. We had gotten a note. He didn't know that we got a note that said that he was getting ISS, so, but he was not doing his homework, and so he kept getting ISS, kept getting ISS. So one day he comes home. And uh, I had two things that my kids were required to do when they first came home from school. Number one was do their homework. Number two was clean the room. I don't know if ever... They both were done simultaneously, but that was kind of one of dad's rules. So one day, he's in his, he's in his trying to be a man stage. And, uh, and so I came home, and we knew. We had, we had, you know, we had the 411. We had the secret information of him. And he comes in. I said, dude, you do your homework. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, that's not what I've been told. And his look on his face of confusion was amazing. But then I said, you know, we got this paperwork to ISS. This kid, this, this is what he said to me. Um, and you'll understand why I said, are you out of your ever love? He said, what are you doing in my business? <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, you have to understand, this wasn't very long of me being out of a pretty rough place. And so I still had some old flesh things in me. So he was sitting up against the couch, like, like the couch is right here. And he was man enough to be like right there in my face. So I just kind of gave him a love tap against his chest. And he flipped over on the couch. He says I beat him, but I... I don't remember it that way. But there's times even when Paul looks at these people that he's discipling, are you out of your ever-loving mind? You know the truth. People have been sent to tell you what the truth is, yet you still are giving in. Why were they giving in? I'm going to tell you that in a minute. But I understand the, when, it, when we see this word foolish within the Bible, it's so powerful. We see in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline this is what paul was raised and he understand what he was saying when he said foolishness proverbs 18 and 2 a fool finds no delight in understanding but only what in expressing his opinion how powerful is that paul knew what he was saying when he called these galatians foolish people this is powerful teaching man paul had already told them james wrote a letter that was delivered to them, yet they still believed. And why did they believe? I'm going to tell you. It's the same reason that Peter got up from the table a chapter ago when he was sitting down with the Gentiles. And all Paul and, and, and the Jewish believers walk in, and those from James' crew come in, and they see Peter sitting at a table. Out of fear, he gets up from the table. Now, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Close. Galatians 3, 4 says this. said, did you endure so much for nothing if really it was for nothing? Paul's referencing the, the, the persecution that the Galatian church is under. And he's like, man, you came out of all of that and now you, you suffered all of this, but was it for nothing? If it was nothing? 
He's rebuking them. There's a huge rebuke. This passage packs a punch. They were running the race. They were doing the right thing. They were living the life that God had created for them to live. And then out of fear, what do they do? They go back. They go back. Could it be that the reason they were giving in is because of the persecution? Maybe they couldn't handle it. Maybe they got to a point that said, enough, I can't do this no more, and decided to give in. This should be a warning for all of us. Look at this right here. Did you, go ahead and bring out that statement, please. The more you become like Yeshua, the closer you'll grow into persecution, or the more you'll become persecuted. I've been seeing this a lot in the body of Messiah, where there's a lot of this happening right now. And not fear, but actually just the very opposite of people undergoing Real persecution. Because I want to tell you something. I want to say this. I wanted to say this in this statement because it's so powerful. You will not be persecuted when you go the same direction as everybody else. I promise you, Christian. I'm talking to Christians right now. If, you're, if everybody's going upstream and you're swimming upstream with them, man, easy life. Everybody will love you. Everybody will accept you. Everybody will be your friend. But the day that you make a decision that the world is not your friend anymore and Messiah is Messiah and he's your king and he's your Lord and you choose to willingly bow your knees and say he is king, beware. Because you will lose friends. You won't be popular. I just experienced this not long ago, the same exact thing where friends of mine, pastors, severed relationships with us because of what we believe. It's amazing how Christians shoot their own because they disagree rather than opening their Bibles. And I said this last week, the more you show those anchor statements, the more you know your Bible, the more you understand this and you talk to a commercial Christian who is more concerned with filling seats and gaining more consumers instead of making disciples. You will become ostracized. Jumping ahead to Galatians 5.11, look at what Paul says. He says, as for me, brothers and sisters, if I still proclaim circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In other words, if I'm doing everything right, if I'm going with the flow, why am I being persecuted then? Because he went against everything. And the day you take a stand for truth and righteousness based upon this and not man's opinion and you study to show yourself approved and you understand that the Torah was given as a way to show God that we love Him. Not for righteousness. It will jack your world up. Listen to Paul here, church. He's putting himself on the line by preaching against circumcision. Paul was a Pharisee. He was on the in crowd. He knew the Torah, and he knows what everyone will say about him, but he was willing. We must understand that all of us who choose to follow Messiah will suffer persecution. We will. And the more time goes on, and the more we're seeing these events and these things begin to take place in our world, the more that's going to happen. You will fail, face rejection from your peers. Satan knows you, and he knows you don't want to be ostracized. Yet there are others of you who have shared with me how lonely you have felt on this journey. Many of you have made the decision to say, I'm going this direction. But my family and my friends, they treat me differently. They ostracize me, and they treat me as an outsider. To you, I say online and in person, hold your ground. Amen. This is just the beginning. There is a movement in this world and pastors and churches, Christians alike, are coming to the truth, realizing that Torah has not been done away with, but now it is real and we need to be watching it because the Bible says that Jesus said the broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life. And few therefore find that path. Don't be misled. Don't be misguided. Finally, I want to wrap it up with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, if the worship team comes, look at what Paul says, written in, the, in, the, in another letter to Paul. This is that second one I told you, it's hidden truth. That's got so much meaning. Look at what he says. So circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters? Keeping God's commandments matters. 
Another anchor statement from the Apostle Paul. The argument in Galatians, whether to be circumcised or not, forget this, the bottom line is this. We are to keep God's commands, His Torah, His laws. Remember John 14, 15 again. He's so passionate. He says, if you love me, if you love me, obey my commands and I'll send the Holy Spirit to you. I'll send him to you. Why is that so important? Because not only is it our seal, but he gives us the power to live out the life we were created for. Everybody stand to your feet. As we wrap this up, I want to take a moment just to spend some time in prayer. This will be hard, yes. You will face opposition. But can I tell you, church, it will be worth it. What beautiful words the Messiah wants to speak to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your salvation. That is the longing of every heart that's a follower of Messiah. Well done. Well done. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As we worship this morning or tonight, today, whatever day it is, praise the Lord. I want you just to spend some time in prayer. And maybe you need to sit. Maybe you need to go over here and kneel somewhere on the platform or around. Just you and dad. And let me tell you something, man. Do it. Draw the line in the sand. Make the decision once and for all. Who is the Lord of your life? As for me and my house, the Bible says, right? We will serve the Lord. Let's make that decision from now on. If none go with me, still I will follow. Let's worship.